Hey, how are you guys doing today? You doing well? Good, welcome. Welcome to those of you that are watching online as well. So glad that you're with us today. Well, today is part five in our five-part series, The Power of Love, The Five Love Languages, a book by Gary Chapman. And so today we're gonna be addressing the topic, the fifth love language, which is physical touch. Now, I wanna let you know today's message is gonna be the shortest message in this series. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's, it's probably gonna be the shortest message that I have ever given in 27 years here at Community. You wanna know why? Because we are in the middle of a global pandemic talking about physical touch. Here's the message, do not touch other people. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> okay, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna have a little bit more than that. Uh, I'm glad that you're here, especially for those of you that kind of braved the hurricane watch that we're in right now, so uh, really, extra stars for you guys for coming on out in this. And welcome to those of you, again, that are watching us online. Now, I'm, I'm, for those of you that have been tracking with us for the last uh, four weeks, I'm gonna give about maybe a one-minute quick overview because not everybody's been a part of every message. So here's the deal. This series has been based upon the book by Dr. Gary Chapman, The Five Love Languages. It was written about 28 years ago, and it's his contention and my belief that we're all wired very differently, and there are five basic ways to communicate love to each other, and Gary Chapman calls these love languages. And the way that you communicate love to other people is the way that you like other people to communicate love to you in, in that way. And we're trying to learn how to best do that in our relationships. And Gary Chapman said this, he says, if you express love in a way that someone doesn't understand, it's not in their love language, they won't realize that you've expressed your love at all. The problem is that you're speaking two different languages. And we've unpacked this throughout this series and given all kinds of examples on how there's a disconnect and miscommunication. And so I'm not gonna spend any more time on that, but that's kind of the, the foundation of what we're talking about. Now here are the five primary love languages that are coming up on the screen. There's, there's acts of service that we talked about four weeks ago, and then quality time, giving gifts and receiving gifts, and then Two weeks ago, I was out last week, but two weeks ago, we talked about words of affirmation. So today, again, it is physical touch. Now, today's message is critically important, as you're gonna hear, especially for those whose primary love language is physical touch. But it's critically important for all of us. Now, if you don't know what your primary love language is, Write this down, snap a pic from the slide that's coming up on the screen. You can go online to fivelovelanguages.com and you can take this test online, you can do that. Now, I'm not encouraging you to actually to do that. What I'm encouraging you to do is the next slide, which is an app that was developed by Gary Chapman's team, it's called Love Nudge, and it says it's a fitness app for relationships. So it's a free app, so you can go to the App Store, you can go to Google Play, download the app, and then when you do that, you can go ahead and take the test right on your smartphone, and then you can link to the other person, the person that you're married to, the person that you're dating, the person that you're engaged to, you go ahead and do that, and then you'll get prompts, you'll get notifications, like, you know what, you need to speak some words of affirmation, or you need to buy this person a gift, that's your language, when was the last time? So you'll get these kind of notifications that will help you, that will serve you so well, that will strengthen your relationship. I just really encourage you to do that and to, to get that app that way. Physical touch is so very important. So we're gonna learn how we can show physical touch in our relationships in appropriate ways. This past week, I, I watched again, I've, I've watched these videos a few times, but, but I just went online, I wanted to see a new one, and so I just went in to, to YouTube and I put uh, free hugs. And if you do that, then there's all kinds of YouTube videos, free hug campaign, and there's a guy that in Australia that started doing this, and it was really became this powerful movement. And, and it, was, it was great to watch. It's usually the, the first or second video that comes up on YouTube. And here's a guy that, that he's, he's holding up the sign and people are looking at him, you gotta be crazy, right? I'm like, I'm going over to you and having you give a hug to me or me give a hug to you. Hug to you. And so, you know, he's met with resistance. And this is all now, this is all PC, pre-COVID, okay, pre-COVID, you know, these free hugs. And so this was all taking place. And, and so people eventually, they would come up to him and uh, they'd give him a hug. And it was, it was awesome. I mean, there were older people, there were younger people, there were men and women, there were teenagers, there's the 20-somethings. And so, and, and you saw what was happening and there's this, this movement of, of just expressing, you know, love and affirmation to people through the power of, of touch. And hugging's an amazing medicine. And for the person that's being hugged, it's a, an emotional boost. There's just no question about that. It's great power and touch. There's been so much research that's been done on this topic. I just wanna hit on a few things and you can, you can just uh, you can 
hit Google and you'll find stuff as well. Doctors have written about a medical condition which is known as skin hunger, skin hunger. Google it, it's true that we actually have a hunger. Our skin has a hunger for physical contact and touch. It's just like there's a physical hunger and we have starvation. If we have skin hunger, it longs for that. And, and uh, if you haven't really experienced it, it's, it's hard to imagine. I talked after the first service to a lady that had been married for 41 years and her husband passed away. And she knew that something was off in her life, but she couldn't put her finger on it. And she said today was like this aha moment for her because she knew that when she came to community and she started developing friends and she was in a life group and she started hugging people, she felt like she was coming back to a sense of normalcy. But she said today, Scott, when you identified it, I got it because my husband was a toucher and, and we embraced and, and that was missing when he passed away. So this is a big deal for, for all of us. And skin hunger is this deep craving, this inner longing for someone to touch you in a loving and appropriate and affectionate way. Doctors tell us that, that neither adults nor children can really live without this. So if you suffer from skin hunger, then you may suffer from, uh, from depression and mood swings and anxiety and irritability and, and pain and discomfort. See, the right kind of touch indicates that we're being cared for, shows that we're loved, shows that we're valid, the right kind of touch. Now, some of you have been on the receiving end of the wrong kind of touch, maybe an anger kind of touch or maybe a, a sexual abuse kind of touch, and it's led you to avoid any kind of touch altogether, and that, that's understandable. If, if you've harmed your spouse, or if you've harmed your child, even in the slightest manner, you need to ask for forgiveness for that, and you need to vow that you would never, ever do it again. Gary Chapman said, physical touch can make or break a relationship and can communicate hate, or it can certainly communicate love. A loving touch can be life-giving. Science tells us that it's a, associated with an, an improved IQ and language acquisition in young children, reading achievement mem and memory, general neonatal development, and, and improved geriatric health. There, there have been hospital studies that have shown that patients recover way more rapidly when they uh, receive a, appropriate physical touch than if not. And, Doyle Van Gelder told about his son, Ronnie. Ronnie was a, uh, was a five-year-old. He was in kindergarten. And one day before school, Ronnie just said to his dad, he said, Dad, I, I think I'm going to be sad today. And his dad goes, is that, is that right, Ronnie? Why, why is that? He goes, well, because when you're sad about something, all of the teachers take turns hugging you. <laughs> Isn't that a great story? I mean, we all appreciate physical touch when it's a, done in an appropriate way. And God wired us to be touched. Human beings need to be touched. Studies show this, that people who experience meaningful touch on a regular basis, they actually have a longer life expectancy than those who don't. So there's great power in touch. Now, in each one of these messages, when we talk about the love language, we talk about how Jew, Jesus was fluent in every single one of these love languages. And so we've talked about that all the way through. And so certainly I wanna talk about how Jesus was fluent in expressing love in the love language of physical touch. And somebody put it this way, what his heart felt, his hand touched. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 8. We're going to spend a couple verses there and most of it in Matthew 9. And if you don't, that's, that's, that's uh, fine. We're going to be on the screen in just a moment. And in this series, we're going to look at some times when, uh, when uh, Jesus so loved other people and today through physical touch. Somebody calculated there's over 30 times the Bible informs us that Jesus either touched other people out of compassion or people touched Jesus out of this sense of hope, this sense of need for his Healing. So let's see Jesus in action. This is Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 and starting. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up, and she began to wait on him. The question is, could Jesus have healed her without touching her? Most certainly he could have. But the miracle showed his power. The touch revealed and showed his love. He didn't have to. He wanted to because he knew how important that was. Chapter 9, verse 18, while he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and he went with him and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. And she said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I'll be healed. And 
Jesus turned and he saw her and he said, take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. Verse 23, when Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, he said, go away. The girl's not dead, but asleep. And they just laughed at him. Verse 25, after the crowd had been put outside, he went in and he took the girl by the hand and she got up. And news of this spread throughout all the region. Could Jesus have healed her without touching her, without taking her hand? Of course he could have, but he knew the power of touch. The miracle revealed his power, but the touch revealed his love. We go on to the next verse. Chapter 9, verse 27, as Jesus went in, on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he, he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, it will be done, and their sight was restored. Could Jesus have healed them without touching them? Of course he could have. The miracle, again, it showed his power, but the touch revealed his love. Jesus could have done drive-by healings. I mean, he could have just stood in one spot and sent out healing vibes to everybody within a 100-mile radius, and everybody could have been healed. He could have done that. He did heal somebody from long distance. If you remember from the message on words of affirmation, there was a centurion who had a servant who was sick, and the centurion said, you don't even have to come to my house. I'm a, basically because I'm a Gentile. You just say the word, say the word, Jesus. And Jesus said, okay, your servant is healed. But Jesus' preference was to look somebody in the eye and to touch them, physical touch, to show that their love, they matter, they're cared for. The miracle showed his power, but the touch, the touch always revealed his love. Now, I've mentioned to you about this book, and it really is a transformational book. It can be game-changing in your relationships, and, 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 and again, I apologize to you one more time for not talking about this for 12 years. I, before that, I talked about it like every three or four years, and I go, oh my word, I haven't, because it's been around for so while. But I'm going to tell you another book that's been around for a while, that if you're new, either to community or new to faith, it's a great book, especially if you're a parent. It's called The Blessing, and you can see it's by John Trent and Gary Smalley. And in the Bible, the Hebrew blessing always involved physical touch. I mean, maybe a, a hand on a head or a hand on a shoulder or an embrace or a kiss. And, and we see this in the New Testament with Jesus, who was in the Hebrew, the Jewish culture. Mark chapter 10, verse 13. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could, he could touch them and bless them. But the disciples told them not to bother him. I love this section of scripture. But when Jesus saw what was happening, he was very displeased with his disciples. He said to them, hey, let the kids come to me. Don't stop them. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And then he took the children into his arms and he placed his hands on their heads and he blessed them. And he gave them the blessing. And Jesus knew exactly what children needed to know that they were valued, that they were wanted, that they were loved, that they were firm. And he spoke life into them and he gave them this blessing. Friends, the truth is there are some things that touch can communicate even more effectively than words. And I think most of us know that to be true. Most of us know the truth about that. There are some times that words just fail us. It's a week ago yesterday that I was a part of a funeral service for Perlane Martin. Perlane passed away due to complications from COVID-19. Perlene was the wife of Sydney Martin, one of our elders here at Community, and it was, it was horrible to see all this play out over a period of months. And because of the nature of Perlene's death, uh, Sydney invited people not to come <laughs> to the auditorium, just out of a carefulness with COVID. And, and we live streamed her service. And I, I said in the last service, that's what's great when you, know, you can say something and somebody will come up and, and give you the information that you need before the next service. And so I said, I don't even know how many people watched it. Now I do. There are 379 families that watched her service on live stream. Many of them in Jamaica, Perlane being from Jamaica. I've, I've been around funerals and dying many times over my 38 years in ministry now. And sometimes it's, it's different. Sometimes if the person's a believer and it was a long struggle, you go to the visitation at a funeral home, there might be a celebration, there might be, there's some tears, but there's stories that are being told. Sometimes though, if there's not hope, and there's as tragic 
You can walk into a funeral home and there can be 30 people in there and, and nobody's even talking. I mean, they're just kind of holding hands and got arms around each other and, and there's just tears and there's power in touch. There's just such great power in touch. Sometimes words fail us and personal, physical touch, it just transforms us. Now, that's certainly true when it comes to sorrow and grief, but there's also power in touch in celebration moments. I mean, you guys know that I love football and the Dolphins are going to the Super Bowl this year. Okay, they're not. But anyway, you know, I, I can dream, can't I? And so anyway, when you watch the Super Bowl, whichever team does win, and I'm thankful that I absolutely it will not be the New England Patriots this year. Can I get an amen on that by anybody? Okay, thank you. So it might not be the Dolphins, but it won't be the Patriots. So, so when you see that at the end of the game, do the players, do they come out? That they, they, they acknowledge the opposing team, and if they're on the team, I just want to congratulate you. It was good. We've won the Super Bowl. No, you see these big, tough, huge guys, you know, just bear hug one another. I mean, there's just so much physical. You see it not only in football, like after a Super Bowl victory, you see it after regular victories as well. But I don't know if you follow baseball, but uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers, they won the World Series just a little less than two weeks ago. And this is in the middle of a pandemic now. When they won the World Series, and there's not six feet between each of them right there. Why? Because they're just celebrating this victory. Because physical touch and celebration is a way to communicate love and affirmation, and it's so important. So here's the deal. Here's the question. You know how practical I try to be in my messages. I want to ask you the question that I've asked in every single one of these up to this point. Who is it in your life that would feel loved if they received an affectionate touch from you? Who is it? Who is it in your life? And I'll be honest with you, I've, I've had to kind of go a little bit direction in the middle of COVID, so I'm not really going down a path of, you know, people that you work with or people in our church or that. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stick to, to family, so, because we're in a pandemic, but maybe it is your spouse. For some people, physical touch is their primary love language. And without it, how do they feel? Well, it's their love language. So without physical touch being expressed to them, they feel unloved. And, and, and we just have to get that. You have to know that. And if when you do that, that, that love nudge test or whatever, and if it's one or two for uh, the, the person that you're, you're married to, the person that you're dating, the person that you're engaged to, and if they're high up on the physical touch scale and physical touch isn't a deal for you, then you need just to step up and understand that that's how they feel loved and to not express love through physical touch leaves them feeling unloved. But with it, their emotional tank is filled and they feel secure and their love of a spouse or their fiance or the person that they're dating. So running your hand through their hair, or when you walk past them, giving them a quick back massage, or holding their hand when you're walking to a store, or you're walking from a mall, or to a restaurant, or when you go on a walk together, kissing and embracing and sexual intimacy are all ways of communicating love, emotional love in a way that a person whose primary love language is physical touch, they understand. There's a guy whose wife was just listless. She had no energy at all. So he convinced her to finally go to the doctor. And she did. And he did a thorough exam of her. And then and, and the husband was in the room because he's the one that was kind of pushing this. And, and he said, you know, I, I've done a thorough exam and I can find nothing wrong with her physically. And the husband said, Doc, you, you've got to do, look, look, she's got no, you've got to do something. You've got to prescribe something. You've got to do something. So the doctor is just kind of looking at his chart a little bit. And then he, he puts it down. He walks across the exam room. And he asks her to stand up. And he just gives her this big hug. And then he pulls back. And then he gives her this big kiss. And then he turns to the husband and he says, she needs that. Three times a week she needs that. The husband just kind of dropped his head, looked at the floor. And he goes, well, I can, I can bring her in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But I play golf on Saturday. <laughs> I like that joke, okay, so. Sometimes we don't get it though. We don't get how important it is for us to be the ones who will express love through physical touch. 
Marriage counselors tell us that one of the accurate gauges of intimacy within a marriage relationship is physical touch. So you see a couple, a couple do they hold hands uh, when they're walking and do they hug one another goodbye and kiss goodbyes or a, a welcome home kiss there. Don't underestimate the connection that takes place when you speak the language of physical touch within marriage. Gary Chapman says, if your spouse's love language is physical touch, then nothing is more important to them than holding them in the middle of a crisis. And hear this, every marriage will have times of crisis, every single one. He said this, in, in a crisis situation, a hug can communicate an immense amount of love for that person. A person whose primary love language is physical touch would much rather have you hold them and be silent than offer advice. Now, friends, one aspect of physical touch is sexual intimacy. And, and some of you, you know, you've listened to all five of these messages and you're thinking of languages of love and you're saying, Scott, you better cover this. You better talk about this. So this is it. This is there. Here you go. This is what I want to talk about. Certainly within a marriage relationship, that is a language, sexual intimacy, sexual uh, intimacy between a husband and a wife. It should be spoken. It should be spoken frequently. It should be spoken passionately. It should be spoken selflessly. God created sex, and he, and he did. It's a wonderful gift for us, and he did so that, one, we would enjoy it, so that we would replenish the earth, and newsflash, the earth has been replenished. It, you know, there's plenty of people around, but God did not create it for that purpose only, that it would bring joy and wonder and intimacy within a relationship, and so never use sex as a weapon, never use sex as punishment, never use sex as a way to control. Gary Chapman said this, many mates feel the most love when they receive physical contact from their partner. For a mate who speaks this love language loudly, hear that, physical touch can make or break the relationship. Now I want you to hear what the Bible says about sexual intimacy and sexual expression within marriage. We need to be reminded of these words from God on this very important topic, so critically important in relationships. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse two, it says, but since there's so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Verse three, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Verse four, the wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. And then Paul sums up this little section of scripture on this topic, and he gives these words. He says, do not deprive each other. Do not deprive each other. Do not deprive each other. It's that important. It can be the glue that holds a relationship together. Part of that glue. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent. You both agree, okay, yeah. Yeah, we need to take a little break. Why? For a time, so we can devote ourselves to prayer. And then come together again, why? Because Satan will tempt you. And so you come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. That's a very important passage of scripture. God speaks to this. God wants us to have sex. <laughs> he created it. And he knows the intimacy that can happen within a relationship and how that can pull two people together. So physical touch needs to be expressed to our spouses in appropriate ways, to our fiancés, those that we're dating. Now, maybe it's your child that needs to be on the receiving end of physical touch. Numerous research studies in the area of child development have made the conclusion that babies who are held, hugged and kissed, developed a healthier emotional life than those who are left for long periods of time. I, I could have got these studies. I mean, you, you've read them. You could do this. Uh, babies being held in orphanages and not held. I mean, they've done these studies. They've seen how babies not only do not thrive that are not held in orphanages in Eastern Europe and in, in Russia and the Soviet Union, that, that they would not only not thrive, they, they would die just because of a lack of touch. And wise parents are touching parents. I want you to hear that again. Wise parents are touching parents. 
But that shouldn't stop as they get older. The pat on the head, the arm around the shoulder, the bear hug, the wrestling match, the tossing of the hair. I'll say to older kids, I, I love you. I love you. And as your children get older, maybe the way that you demonstrate that changes. Maybe now it becomes wrestling on the floor in the family room. When our kids were little, there's three, three and a half year difference between the two. When our, our kids were little, and like five and two, or six and four, or whatever that, or six and three, I was good at math, right? And then, uh, so when, when they were little, uh, we would do this thing called family hug, and Lori and I and the two boys would come together, and we'd go, family hug and family hug. Well, here it is now. Our oldest son's 34, youngest son's 31, and we still do family hugs, and, and, and they love it. You know, actually, I'm not sure if they do, but Lori and I do, and that's what's important. I mean, we say family hug, and now the family is so much bigger with their wives, and we got five grandkids, family hug, family hug. And Here's my favorite picture, I believe, is a pop-pop, is a grandfather, now that I have five grandchildren. It's Jeremiah and me taking a walk. We're on a trail. There's really about 15 people that are behind us, and we just happened to be out in front. And I was kind of leading the way. And I was talking to Jeremiah about something. This is like a year, year and a half ago. And Jeremiah did something that he had never done before. I mean, he's not a hand holder. He just, we're talking, and he just reached up and he grabbed my hand. And I'm going, oh my word. I didn't say anything. Didn't want to draw attention to it. And he didn't let go for maybe 15, 20 minutes because it was a long trail. And it was, it was just this wonderful time. He'd never done that before. Truth is, he's never done it since. Every now and then, I'll show Jeremiah, you remember that time when you were holding my hand? Say, yeah, forget it. I mean, he's five years old. He's already too cool to hold his pop-pop's hand. So there's gonna come a time when your kids no longer wanna do that. And maybe you even remember that. Maybe, you know, you can remember the time or, or it hasn't happened yet. You're holding your kids' hands and you're walking toward a store and you're in the parking lot and you're halfway holding their hand just to protect them from, you know, running out or doing something stupid. And you're, so you're holding on to them, but they're older now and, and you're holding their hand and they're still going for it until they see a friend from school. And so what do they do? They kind of pull their hand out and they go, you yeah, know, kind of, I'd, I'd rather not. I'm kind of embarrassed by that dad. I'm embarrassed by that mom. So what do you do? Well, you, you can do A, you can realize that, okay, that's just a part of them becoming more independent and allow that and not even address it. Or B, like I did when they pulled away, I, I actually would grab them and give them a bear hug and say, I love you so much, pumpkin, and make sure that their friends would hear that. Okay, I never did that, I never did that. But I did enjoy, you know, periodically embarrassing my kids. Not, you know, dramatically, but just enough so that they'd have something to talk about in therapy one day, so... <laughs> But it changes, so just understand the way your child is wired, and, but you still find ways to express physical touch. I mean, my sons are 34 and 31, and I promise you, when I see them, I always go, and they're the best hugs ever. I just, they hug, and it's not just me, it's them, and there's just something about that. Maybe for you, the person that you need to express love to through physical touch isn't a spouse or a fiance or somebody that you're dating. Maybe uh, it's not a child that's in your life. Maybe it's an elderly parent. Maybe it's a grandparent. The studies that I read say that some of the most touch hungry among us are older adults. It's especially true if they've lost a spouse. My dad passed away 15 years ago, and I, I still remember the months after that, I mean, really years after that. My mom did not want to come to South Florida to, to live down here. It took me years to finally convince her to come down here, but, but she was not in a state where she could really look after herself, so she's in a really nice assisted living facility. And so that was back in the day where you, you, could, fly to, uh, you could fly one way to Jacksonville from Fort Lauderdale in Southwest for like $30. $30. So, I mean, I'd book all these flights for a year. I'd go up every single month for a day or two. And, and when I would see her, I'd take her out to lunch. And I never did this before my dad passed away. And it was a little awkward the first time I did it. But when I was driving, I, I just reached over and I just, I just held her hand. Because I knew that there was no touch in her life at this point. And, and, and every time that I would go see her, I would say, hey, mom, this is, this is a hug from me. And I'd give her this long hug and I would hold on as long as I thought she wanted me to. I mean, she would hold on. Sometimes it'd be like a five second hug, a 10 second hug. And I would just hold on as, as long as I sensed that she wanted to hug. 
And then I'd come back and say, you know what, mom, Lori also wanted me to give you a hug. So I would give her a second hug from Lori. And then I'd say, and Chris wants me to give you a hug. And then again, and there's all this physical touch. And then Steve, and then then I even played like a little game with her. I said, you know, mom, you know, uh," and I'd go back and forth. So both, both of both of my boys are great huggers, so, so I'd say one time Chris, one time Steve. You know, uh, Chris is not a very good hugger, and so I'd give her a lame hug. She's, she, he is too a good hugger, so it's just something to do, but it's a way that I could express love to my mom through physical touch because it's so critically important. Here's what the Bible says. I love this verse of scripture, message paraphrase, Proverbs 3.27. It says, never walk away from someone who deserves help. Your hand is God's hand for that person. My hand is like the hand of God. We talk about being the hands and the feet of Jesus, but my hand is like the hand of God to that person that might need a physical touch, love expressed that way. There's a guy named George who went to his doctor and he's just had so much anxiety and he said, doc, I I think I'm dying. I'm dying everywhere. I'm just, I hurt all over. I said, when when I I touch my hand, it hurts. When I touch my arm, it hurts. When I touch my face, it hurts. When I I touch my my chest, it hurts. And I I just hurt all over and I I, I think, uh, I think I'm dying. And and the doctor gave him a thorough exam. He said, George, I got some good news for you and I got some bad news for you. The good news for you is you're not dying. The bad news is you got a broken finger is what's going on. (laughs) Okay. I think the apostle Paul would say this to us. He said, "I've, I've got some bad news for you, and I've got some good news for you. The bad news is you are dying. As a matter of fact, you're already dead in your trespasses and your sin. You're... Even the people that Jesus healed, they eventually died. Even the people that Jesus raised from the dead, Lazarus, alive, dead. Jesus brought him back to life, and then dead again. So we're all physically going to die, and we're also spiritually dead and our trespasses and sin. Bad news, good news is that we're made alive in Christ. The apostle Paul wrote these words in Colossians chapter two, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. And Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. So there's, there's bad news, but there's great news that even though we're dead, he can make us alive. Jesus came to bring life and hope and to transform us. And here's the thing. If you've never received his healing touch of his amazing grace, today could be your day. We're gonna be done with the service in just a moment. After it's done, you can come forward, you can talk to one of our decision counselors and you can, you can talk with them about a spiritual decision. You can have them pray with you. You can move from death to life, from, well, no hope to hope, the hope of heaven. And Jesus came to give you life in all of its fullness. And you can receive that touch that he came to give you today. And if you're online, the same thing can happen for you as well. Uh, You can talk to one of our pastors online and talk to them about making that most important decision. You matter to God. Jesus demonstrated how much you matter to him through by being fluent in every single one of the love languages that we've talked about in this series. Acts of service, quality time, words of affirmation, giving gifts. The greatest gift is life and physical touch. God made it so clear. But the greatest demonstration of God's love for us, there's no question, is his sacrifice for us on a cross. And if you've never accepted Jesus as your savior and as your Lord today, it could be your day. And I I pray that it will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I I thank you for today. I I thank you that we've been able to journey through this series together and we've been able to learn some things, maybe about ourselves, maybe about the people in our relational worlds. Father, I pray that through your spirit, you would prompt us and nudge us and help us to express love in more effective ways. God, that that for some of our relationships, this new information would be game-changing. Father, for all of us who seek to honor you and love you, I I pray for those who have not yet accepted Jesus as their Savior, as their Lord, that today would be their day. They they would sense the love of Jesus for them, a, a Savior, the bringer of hope, dying on a cross to give life, and eternity to all who would receive him. So Father, I pray that you'd be with those who have not yet done that. Father, thank you for the hope of heaven. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the way that you care for us. 
in, in so many ways. And Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name and, and for his sake. Amen.